Well, I think growing up in Zanzibar, which is um, in a way a concentrated cosmopolitan society. Uh, this series of uh, presentation is part of the Awakening Project. And at that time then I joined here, the, it was in government Indian Junior. We have 90 participants, we had uh, more now. Questions. We have Asnain, you want to take over and handle the questions? Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum and uh, Dr. Saib, this was uh, very profound and uh, Diamond Dala says uh, very informative and thanks. And there's a question from uh, Murtaza Jivraj, who's the head of the archives from uh, Africa Federation. So he is asking Dr. Saib, how can we create interest in the youths to know our history? Yeah, I know Murtaza Bhai very well because I have to say he's a walking encyclopedia and uh, he has been very helpful to me as well as Roshan Bhai Fazal and previous chairmen um, in uh, putting the uh, material together. And so I have very high respect for Murtaza Bhai and I think he's, I can understand why he has asked this question. Uh, it's very important that if we do not <clears throat> our youngsters um, uh, have a, a meaning behind their own sort of heritage. In other words, they must understand the meaning behind why we call ourselves Kojas. They're, then they will not have any meanings for them to retain their koja or to have any uh, heritage. So to the question how we can do that is really by education. And I think that we have missed the boat in some ways, uh, but then the World Federation and Africa Federation have started the archives and also they have, uh, uh, the World Federation have marked now. And I think to some extent, uh, we are now sort of uh, trying to make uh, our community uh, at all levels understand uh, where we have come from and how we struggle to establish our community. And if we do not take interest in the community's heritage, as well as the future of the community, which have, I mean, the heritage has served us well so far, but if we don't take interest in the future of the community and how we became what we became, and then our future generation within our community will find that the community is a completely different community altogether. So it's very important to make sure that the community is educated uh, in, a, in, in a way that is interesting for them and meaningful for them. I, I hope, hope Mutsabai, uh, I, I have answered your question to some extent. Bolo? So next uh, question before we go to Ali Reza is why did you stop your book for, to 1960 and not have just continued until present and compiled it into just one book? You know, when you start the research of this, um, of this magnitude, it's not easy. There, are, there is so much information and uh, uh, the reason why I, I stopped at 1960, the, uh, well, one reason is of course, too much material and I had to sort of, even, even with this 300 pages, I'm condensing it. Uh, then I won't be doing justice to those pioneers who have given us the community as we know it today. So I want to do justice. So that was one. And secondly, by 1960, our quest for religious identity we had already identified and institutionalized as Koja Shia Ishnashis. So 1960 was a nice, nice sort of a defi de defining line or dividing line. Soon after, we then of course came across the 1964 Zanzibar revolution, uh, Uganda crisis, Somalia crisis, a political, social, economic crisis throughout Africa uh, uh, in, in that sense. So, and, and then of course, uh, the formation of the World Federation and us becoming a globalized community. So it then began to give us a different sense of who we are. We used to live in that, um, in that confined world of East Africa. And when we had to come out of that world, we then had to cross boundaries, cultural boundaries, ethical boundaries, 
religious boundaries. We have to understand others. And therefore, we then have to understand ourselves also first. And, and so the book from 1960 onwards begin to take that ethos into account. And it's a very interesting analysis. Um, I don't know how it will pan out and what, what my concluding uh, words would be, but there you are. That's why I divide it into two sections. Excellent. So just one more question here about the book before we go to Alira size. When is your book going to be published? You know, since, um, look, it's, it's being edited at the moment. Uh, I cannot say regrettably or sadly, because I thought I had finished it. But I'm now getting information from our community. There are some very interesting things that are coming through. So whilst I'm editing, I'm also have to, I also have to put these things into the book once uh, it's evidentially correct, corrected. So uh, give me six months, hopefully the book will be out, inshallah. It's one more question about the book before we go to Ali Reza. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Ali Reza, he's been waiting for a bit. So how do you compare the content of your book and your future book versus the endangered species of Marhum Hassan by Jafar? Yes, uh, uh, Hassan by Jafar uh, actually uh, had an umbrella approach. In other words, uh, his approach was not much more specific like mine. He's, de he's dealt with uh, uh, Khojas, not of East Africa, but also India and other parts of the world. But obviously some of the experiences that he relates do compare well with what I have, uh, what the research is bringing out. So if I can put it in a very succinct way, Hassan Bai's approach was much more umbrella approach. Mine was much more specific. I'm dealing with a particular community of East Africa. Um, the reason why I chose to deal with that, with that community is because I come from that community first. So I had, I under, understand the nuances and the subtleties, but also uh, the important thing is that we developed as a community at a very, very earlier stage than compared to the Koya community in India, in Gujarat. So that, uh, that also, also raised the question, why did we, why were we able to, to, to develop and institutionalize so quickly in Zanzibar compared to India. There were, there were a couple of factors which I go into the book. The one of the main factor was that we had the Islamic matrix well entrenched in Zanzibar and the Swahili ethos, which allowed us, and of course the Omani Sultanate, which allowed the freedom of religion and all that. So um, that helped us to, uh, to organize. I will allow Ali Raza to go ahead and ask please. Assalamu alaikum, Didi. Yeah, um, alaikum salam. Sala yes, yes, Ali. Salam to Don't the group as well. Don't ask me a hard well. question. <laughs> I, I, prom I promise I won't. And salam to the group as well, especially uh, Gulam Uncle and Mosin Kimji who looked after us in Toronto. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And also, I've witnessed firsthand the amount of work that you put into this initiative, uh, the Awakening Project. Uh, a lot of countless hours behind the scenes. Uh, what is your um, overarching purpose of, of the initiative? Um, and is there, a, is there an intention to also combine efforts with our own institutions? Because I believe there must be a lot of metrics and statistics of the community that we can prosper from. And then uh, the other question I have is from my sort of generation, this presentation is very, very informative and helps to instill pride in where we come from. Why do you think um, that maybe often the other youth are not as engaged or interested? Do you have any ideas in terms of how we can restore that sense of pride um, in our heritage? Not just our heritage, but also um, if you can share some examples of how we've contributed to the wider Shia community, because I think that also helps us understand uh, just the amount of work that our forefathers have done for the wider Shia umbrella as well. Um, so a couple of questions there, I know. And also, if you can sign one of your books for me uh, when you release, that would be fantastic. Ahsan. Thank you, Ali Reza. I didn't expect such a wide-ranging question from you, Ali. 
<laughs> uh, anyway, I'll try and answer. I mean, I think um, uh, it's, it's, it, it, the answer could be quite elaborate, but let me just give you a synopsis of it. I mean, one, one area which you alluded to was that the youngsters are not interested. And the reason why they're not interested is because they don't understand their heritage very well, and they don't understand the meaning of what Koja Shri Aishnashri, or rather what Koja Shri Aishnashri means to them. But once you explain how we came to uh, uh, identify ourselves as Koja Shri Aishnashri and the history behind it and the struggles behind it, then I think that it will become more meaningful existentially for them. As you know, the biggest crisis for 21st century is the identity crisis. And, and if somebody asks you, where do you come from? And if you don't have, or why do you call yourself Koja Shri Aishnashri, with the community that you come from, and you are unable to answer that, you do go into an identity crisis in that sense. So it's very important for all our youngsters, for those who are born and those going to be born, to understand that if they are coming from this particular community, that they must understand the history behind it. And it's a very interesting history. We would not have survived had we not, our, our pioneers, grandparents would not have uh, struggled to maintain their faith. And for 160 years to survive in a globalized world says something about the strength of the community. So that's, that's, that, that's one. The other, the other thing is that as a small community, relatively speaking, um, we have contributed to the development of other communities to a huge way. I mean, uh, when I was Secretary General uh, at the World Federation level, uh, the amount of money that we contributed for the development of others, uh, only because we understood our faith. We understood the struggle of our faith. And therefore we felt if other communities are going through, through poverty or whatever the reason is, that their faith are undermined in any way, the Koja Shi Aishinashi community were in the forefront, at least as a community, to help and assist. I think Alireza, with that, uh, I think the rest of it, I can, I can deal with it at home if you like. <laughs> no I'll problem. Sign, I'll sign a book for you. Ahsan. Nice Thank seeing you. your face, Ali. Thank you. Of course. Ahsan. Thank you very much for this elaborate question. So I'm going to ask you a very mild question now, and then I'll pass it to Nazmul Bai. So that Kushali Bankro that you mentioned, can you give us a little bit of uh, detail or the purpose of it? And was this the emergence of the Baraza gathering and the word Baraza concept that is happening today? So uh, that Kushali Bankro. You know, Hashlein, um, I never thought in that line. And the fact that you are thinking in that line, I think you can be a good historian as well. Um, yes, Kushali Bankro. Bankro means uh, uh, material made of uh, wood. So what used to happen was that during the big occasion, like Prophet's Kushali, uh, in Zanzibar, if you look at, if you go to Stone Town, there are sort of small alleyways, you know, which, which gives you the sense of how the streets look like. And the community are very near each other. They are like, you know, different communities, but really one community in that sense. That was the ethos, Swahili ethos of Zanzibar. And uh, during the uh, celebration of this nature, the wooden chairs and the wooden benches used to come out and they used to be lined in the streets and the whole community would partake in the kushali of our prophet with all the goodies that the communities decide to give on that particular day. And I think that I would not be surprised if Baraza actually came, uh, uh, um, emerged if you like, uh, from from their the typical East African type of baras, maybe. Nas Mumbai. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, is is very very short. My blood, my roots are through the Lohanas. Now this is going back four or five generations. And these days, there is that tussle between the religious identity and the cultural identity. And there are times when I closer to my Hindu brothers, 
And there are times when, you know, I would just say, no, 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 wait a minute. This is my religious identity. This is where I'm going. How do we get our youth and our community to sort of coexist and accept the other faiths um, without, without uh, well, okay, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an interesting question. It's a very loaded question as well in that sense, but I'll try and answer it if I may. Um, I mean, if you look at our own history as, uh, as we developed from, from the Koja community. Now the Koja community, is a, it was a syncretic community. It had a lot of beliefs within itself. So we, we are emerging from a community that had a lot of beliefs within it. So that's a, that's, a, that's a point to take on board that we come from that sense, if you like. Our roots have that sense uh, of plurality, if I may put it like that. And then we were in search of a correct belief. So we then found a belief around which we cohere and we form the community. But then what happened was that I give my, I take my hat off to our great grandfathers that they retained the word Khoja and Shia Isnashri so that they, it gives them that cultural pathway to form a relationship with others. And also Shia Isnashri, which is a belief system within which they felt comfortable. So, you know, if you look at the Koja Shia Isnashris, when they came out of East Africa, so we were dead in the Kubo in East Africa. So we had built the whole expectation around that. And we thought that we were something. And even a dead Kuo must have thought that he was the king in that Kuwa. So what, when it came out, our adaptability was fantastic. Our networking was fantastic. I mean, by the sheer fact that we survived as a community, even after we came out of East Africa in the 60s and the 70s up till today. And what is happening is we are evolving. Where we will evolve to is in our hands. The destiny is in our hands. If we explain the heritage in the right way to the community, to the youngsters, that don't be defensive about where you come from. We have put as much blood in the cause of Islam, as the Iraqis have done, as the Iranis have done, as Lebanese have done for their faith. And when we go and meet our 12th Imam one day, inshallah, then we will say that we have also played a part in the cause of Islam for a small community like ours. So don't be defensive about it, but look at the history behind why we call ourselves Khoja, Shia, Isna Ashari. Yeah, I think really what I was getting at was the confusion between you know, the religious identity and the cultural identity. And these days, you know, we are sort of more like Arabs in, yes, yes. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> this will be a long discussion. So, yeah, yeah. Jawad, Jawad Bhai, you have a question? Yeah, Asalaamu As Alaikum, uh, Sultan Bhai. Oh, Asalaamu Alaikum, Salaam, Jawad, how are you? It's nice to see you. It's good to see you. We are here in uh, 12 inches of snow. So, you know, hopefully okay. your end. Anyway, I really enjoy following you and I really appreciate the work you're doing. It's fantastic work. It's so uh, fortunate to have somebody like you who is doing some deep thinking on the identity issues. You know, I've shared with you my, uh, what I wrote about in 1995, but I have a question for you, which is a little more general. Do you, are Koja Shia Ethnashri communities encouraging clear, independent critical thinking that is necessary to live up to the vice regency of mankind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us in the glorious Quran? Or do our communities merely encourage bringing up generation after generation of cultural Muslims who may at times find it convenient to compromise their principles? For example, engagement in unethical practices like bribery that became more pervasive in Tanzania after Azim Yola Arusha, right? I mean, are we principled or are we, you know, adaptable, conveniently adapting to see to our, you know, uh, financial or whatever worldly success that may be? 
or are we principled for the for the eternal success? Uh, Jawad, it's a very interesting question, and um, I think you <clears throat> you have put me in a position now to now I have to answer it, and I'm going to answer it to you. I think if you look at historically, our community has always strived for searching for the truth. This is in our DNA, I feel. It is searching for the truth. And by 1960, however we have arrived at, we did arrive at the Islam we understood at that time. But when we came out of East Africa, the Islam that, I mean, Islam, when I say Islam we understood at the time is Islam that you were given from the member, basically. Because not many of us traveled outside East Africa or had the intention to study religion in a way we are now doing it at the moment. So the community evolved up to that stage, as I, as I see it in the book, that they came to a belief Shia is nationally, alhamdulillah, and they uh, maintained it, they uh, um, strengthened it, uh, and that is helping us. But when we come to the globalized time now, and to your question as to how do you think that we are now going to move forward, I think that is an evolution uh, that has got quite a lot of other factors involved with it. One good factor, one good factor that I see in our community is that a lot of young mind now wants to study Islam. They are now becoming more critical of how to um, look at Islam uh, with the way the world they're living in, and and how Islam should provide. A humanity, a humanity way forward. In other words, that they are insan and humanity, human being first. And Islam has come to guide a human being to turn them into, into Muslim. But this process itself requires criticalness and understanding when you are living within the culture, which is much more wider, multi, crossing boundaries, uh, ethics, all that sort of thing. And within which you have to carve out your understanding of Islam. And that criticalness I see developing in my community. And Alhamdulillah, if we go down that route that our youngsters now are taking interest in understanding Islam in a way it should, then I see a very good future for our community because we will then evolve into another level where, for example, Koja Shia Ithnashari will also mean that we are much more universal in our approach. Although we have tied ourselves to Koja, it's only because we have the history there. But in our universality, which would be much more, uh, if I can, you can put it as universal values, attach much more universal values than cultural or other values attached to it. That is my, uh, that is how I see it. And in fact, when, I, when I'm writing the next book, the analysis is much more, uh, you see, you have to have evidences and all that to put across. I'm just giving you my general feeling at the moment. Although Awakening Project has done a lot of statistical work and it has given me almost 500 to 1,000 comments from our community, which allows me to judge the mindset of our community and how the silent majority are saying to me privately. So obviously, you know, you have a sense of, uh, of, uh, of a community. So that is my sort of reading of how uh, we are moving, we, we should, we would be moving forward. But then of course, social media is playing a part. You will see uh, different interpretations of Islam coming into it, allowing our boys and girls to understand Islam in the wider sort of perspective. So all that uh, is very important. And we pray, of course, that our Iman remain faith in all those dynamics that goes around us. Thank you very much. Jawad, I hope I've answered your question to a certain extent. Thank you very much. It's a long topic. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this detailed answer. Uh, another milder question now, before we go to Zinat Bai. There seems to be a lot of interest uh, in heritage and uh, preserving heritage. Will you be doing a tour, a Koja heritage tour in East Africa, since you have been to so many cities and places <laughs> So we experience a walking book. I think there are walking books. Uh, thank you, Zinat Bhai. There are, and a nice question. There are walking books in East Africa who can obviously provide you with all that. 
I think it's a very uh, um, uh, important, uh, interesting um, uh, suggestion. And I'm sure uh, uh, people from Mark are listening to this and people from Africa Federation are listening to, to this. And I'm sure that uh, we can all work something out uh, so that uh, such trips, which are very is, uh, necessary trips to see places like Kilwa, Lindi, Songea, Tunduru, uh, and then the Ugandan's landscape, very interesting, the Ugandan landscape, and the Mombasa Lamu landscape, Dar es Salaam, Bagamoyo land. These are very interesting heritage uh, towns uh, from our perspective, those who were born in East Africa or have grandfathers coming from there. So very good point, Zina Dubai, and I, uh, and I hope that the community will work towards that. So actually this question was not from uh, Zinat uh, Bai, oh. but the, uh, we will let Zinat Bai uh, ask her question. Zinat right, Bai, okay. please go but ahead. Whoever asked that Bai. question, please thank him, yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah. Salaamu Alaikum, Siftan Bai. Uh, alaikum uh, This is Reza Hiji. I'm using my wife's iPad. That's why her name appears. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Who are you? I'm Reza Hiji. All right, okay. Game show, Reza yeah, but fine. So, game show, okay, yeah. I, will, uh, I have a question. Uh, you alluded to the issue of uh, the Dubai Jamaat, where there was some tension to include the Indian and Pakistani uh, born uh, Kojas. And uh, if I remember right, is uh, the majority of Dubai's are uh, from East from East Africa or mainly Zanzibar, and there was quite a bit of tension at one time. I'm not sure of the situation now. Now, on the same vein, the issue now is that in Toronto, for example, where I am, um, there is the Iraqi and the Irani communities, a number of Shia communities who would love to come to our mosque because we are one of the most organized uh, groups, so to speak. And uh, there was some discussion whether they belong to uh, our, even though our Jamaat is called, it's not called Koja, because it changed many, many years ago, if you remember. It is now a Shia international Jamaat. It's not a Koja Shia international Jamaat. So the issue uh, with connecting with that issue is the question of the gene pool of the Kojas. We've remained 120,000 for the last 100 years, or maybe even more. And if you look at uh, many families, when they get married, is we know within two, three uh, families, we, we have a, a relative, for example. And I see a potential issue of a gene pool dilution here. Do you see a, a situation where, even though we are Kojas, to allow the Iranian and the other Iraqi who can bring new blood into the community and we grow as a Shia community, with our contribution of the Koja mindset. Uh, I don't know if you can address that in, in any way you can. Yes, I will. I will address it for you. And I think that uh, it's a very important question. I think it relates to the future of our community. Yes. You brought in the fact of gene pool. I absolutely agree with you because our gene pool is confined. I also, if you know, my father had six children. I have three children. So our community, if we remain membership-wise, our community is shrinking in that sense. People say 150,000 Koja Shia Ishnashis. Marhum Mullah used to tell me that it's only 90,000 at that time. I'm talking about 1990s. And I just took a figure 124,000 because of the number of Pagambars that we had. So I just took 100, because we haven't got statistics, by the way. Right. Um, so so there is, there is now it's going to be a real issue for us because we are building jamaats, we're building institutions, we're building holes, we're building imbam baras, masjid, but our community is shrinking. So how are we going to increase our community? Mm. And uh, the identity that we have, Koja Shia Ishnashris, would have to, we have to become malleable. We have to make sure that that identity is a bit, we have to make it fluid so that we can manage the expectations of the community and at the same time increase the population or, or people who wants to become part of the Koja community. Let me give you an example. If you want to be a Koja, then you have to first of all become a Luhara, then you have to become an Ismaili, 
then you have to become an ishnashri. So you can't make somebody kafir, I'm, I'm sorry, to a non-believer in that sense of, of, of oneness of Allah. I, I'm sorry about if I disturb someone, uh, it just came out, but basically you can't just make some person go through that, uh, that be become a Luhana, then Ismaili, then, then Ishnashri. So what is the other way out for it, for us? The only way we can, we can deal with this situation is allowing the others to come to our community, sitting with us, standing with us, playing with us. And when they feel, and we feel that they are part and adapted our culture, then we can take them as cogents. And I'll tell you one thing, that in Zanzibar in 1956, there was a case in Zanzibar, which went to the court in which case the trust, one of the trustees was a non-Koja. And so the court had to actually go through the whole history of the Koja and, uh, uh, and then come up with uh, uh, a conclusion. But when, if I remember rightly now, when Africa Federation, at that time Africa Federation was existing, when they were asked about this issue, because the person who was a trustee had become a president of the Jamaat, it's a non koja but still become a president of the Jamaat. So basically, we already have an example in that sense that when somebody has sat with us, talked with us, played with us, accepted our culture, after a certain number of years, we can make him a koja. There is absolutely no reason why we can't do that. And this is the only way we have to move forward. And I think a time will come when the leadership have to to uh, come to this understanding that you cannot just retain that notion of identity, which is narrow. To survive, we have to broaden our definitions and we will have to define who Koja is in the future times to come. Otherwise, we will just have a community shrinking and shrinking to a, to a time when there won't be coming, there won't be anyone coming to look after all the all the buildings that we have uh, created or built. So I hope that I have given you some indication where I'm coming from. Yes, yes. Can I f uh, follow up a little bit with the permission of the moderator? As, uh, if you don't mind, please, Zika. Okay. We only have five more minutes. Sit in by. Raza, sorry about that. No, no problem. Um, right. Uh, we have uh, Iqbal Devji in the audience. Sit uh, by your mate. Uh, Matt Iqbal Deoji, he is uh, an Ismaili, he runs uh, kojawiki.org, uh, does a lot of research, you know about his work, he knows about your work. Iqbal, do you want to make a comment or uh, add anything to the discussion? Yeah, Iqbal, uh, yeah. yeah, can you ahead. hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, September, that was a very, very... Uh, what should I say? Very elaborate presentation. Uh, I know your work. I met you in Bombay. Um, so I, I, I'm so happy that you have embarked on, on, a, on a search for history and, and that this is going to enlighten your, your, your readers quite a bit. I'm looking forward to the book. I wanted to make one, one or two comments. One was that uh, with respect to, to the contribution of uh, uh, the, the, the the syncretic uh, sort of nature of Zanzibaris in terms of the Swahili culture. Um, what, what one of the comments that I read was that uh, almost forty percent of Swahili is Oriental, and uh, almost all of the Hindi words that are quote unquote in Swahili or Indian subcontinent words are actually Kachi. And uh, because the, of, uh, of the presence of the Khojas in uh, Muscat, and then as they came down, the initial Khojas came down from Muscat to Zanzibar, it, the growth of the Swahili language was actually at the same time as the migration of the Khojas. You know? So there's a massive contribution of Khojas to the Kachi language. The other thing I wanted to say to you was that the as I, I've been doing research with respect to uh, the Koja as a, as a jat, as a ca caste, going back to almost 1500s. 
And the thing that is, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is clear to me is this, that um, we were very much a mercantile community. Um, we were, um, the title Koja has been, uh, okay, or, or at times it's been considered to be a religious title, but in, in, in so far as the Middle East was concerned, uh, Kwaja or Koja or Hoja, these were titles that were given to honorable people um, as an honorific title. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't necessarily have to do with uh, a particular religious connotation. And uh, I'm finding out that there was more to do with respect to the activities that the Hojas did and how they came together as a, as a mercantile group, as a group that supported itself and supported others to, uh, within their group to go into uh, business and uh, trading and travel. Uh, this is something that I'm going to explore further because I feel that, uh, uh, as Nazmul said, there is the, 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 the religious identity and then there is our connection with the subcontinent. And we can't ignore that. that we, we eat Indian food, we speak Indian language, we look like Indians, and therefore, you know, we have a strong connection with the subcontinent. We shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that. The, the, the last thing I wanted to tell you was the, the way I, 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 you mentioned the Kojas were self-governing, and I wanted to point out to people that, in fact, for almost three, 400 years, the Kojas were governed by what they called the Justi, which was a council uh, of, of uh, elders uh, elected, selected, whichever way you want to put it, but in the Jamaat Kana, the Kojas would congregate, the male Kojas would congregate and would choose amongst themselves those that they felt were going to be uh, a better place to, to uh, arbitrate disputes between them, uh, also to, to, to provide help to those who needed help. As Nazmul said, I'm doing research. My, my website is called uh, kojawiki.org. Um, and uh, you're welcome to look at it and welcome to contribute to it if you can. Thank you, Nazmul. Okay, good to hear from you, Iqbal. Uh, okay, last couple of minutes, I'll just introduce the subject for next Sunday. Um, uh, just, just a minute, just a minute. The oh. next Sunday, same time. Oh, I'll confirm the timing in the announcement. It's connecting and communicating with the younger generation. Okay, so uh, that will help um, guys like me. How do I get closer to my grandkids? Because they talk a different language and <laughs> sometimes it's not that way, Dad, uh, Grandpa, the other way. Anyway, um, Mohsin, final word to you. Um, and then uh, I'll take uh, sit in by for his time. Mohsin, go ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Uh, all, all I wanted to say is that I was listening to the last comment made by respected brother um, regarding the Koja issue. I can see the name changing to Indian, mo you know, moving the name from Koja to Indian. See, we have, we have Iraqi culture, we have Iranian, we have Pakistani, we have Afghanistani. Now, instead of, instead of the word Koja, maybe we should classify our, ourselves as Indians, and maybe that way we'll not be a shrinking community. Thank you. Sister Mbai. <laughs> well, then the question will arise, what is an Indian then? Who is an Indian? And that, <laughs> Good. that opens Good. up a huge, a huge box uh, of identity. So, well, no, you, you... I, I understand. Uh, uh, let me just uh, make a point, and I'll cover both Mohsin's and, uh, and Iqbal's uh, point of view. I think Iqbal's comments were, uh, were uh, uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, majority, most of the academic work that is now coming out does relate to what he has said about uh, the Swahili language vis-a-vis -vis the Kachi language uh, and uh, the absorption of the words. Uh, so uh, that, that, is, that, that, is, that is there. Uh, but what is important now uh, to understand that there are identity theories that are coming uh, along which are now talking about consciousness rather than the attachment to the physical space as such. So um, 
uh, how I have related our identity uh, in the book is through consciousness that we in East Africa, actually well, we knew we came from there, but we lost the touch with uh, those lands. Uh, at least the Kojashi Aishnashis lost touch with those lands. They revived it again in uh, uh, um, further down the line, but, um, uh, uh, and, and therefore, what sort of attachment was it to that part of the uh, part of the land? It was just a consciousness without attaching physically to Kachor Kachowa. There was that consciousness as they came from there. And so uh, our, um, uh, uh, our uh, um, what is it called, um, diasporic nar narrative, I have constructed through consciousness. So this is the point I wanted to make, not in a simplified way that we parted from the Koja community, so they became Ismaili, we became Ishnashi. No, it's much more complex than that. And I, I allowed the consciousness to come and play a part. Wonderful. Sitambai, thank you so much. So when the book is out and you know, we'll get you back uh, in due course to sort of tell us more about it. And you know, Inshallah. again, I'm seriously thinking our one hour session for such types of presentation is not enough. Uh, this is already what an hour and 45 minutes, uh, but uh, anyway, we'll think about that. But thank you again sincerely for all your time and an excellent presentation. Uh, thanks again, and we'll thank see you, you most of you, everybody, next Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very thank much. You. So, so our, our apology that we could not uh, go to all the questions, but uh, yes, this was a very interesting, and we may need some more time. Thank you. Thanks, Aspin. Kudafis. <laughs>